Hey everybody out there, this is Seto, and today for you guys, I'm going to be doing a top five video of the top five things that only old school players out there will completely understand. Now, I'm not saying that if you've been playing this game for three or four or five years, that you may understand all these concepts. You may understand all these words I'm about to say, or these concepts perfectly fine. You may understand them completely. But the reason I'm making this video is because I was having a recent discussion with a friend of mine who I had actually thought had been playing this game you know, for a long time, but apparently he's only been playing for three years, come to find out. And when I was trying to discuss with him and tell him how Yu-Gi-Oh! had evolved and everything, and I was using these old words and terminologies that don't get thrown around as much anymore, he had no idea what the heck I was talking about at all. So because of that reason, I decided to make this video on top five things that only old school players will understand. So I'm not saying if you're a new school player you don't understand these words, but you may not understand all of them. So without further ado, let's get to number five, guys. And number five, we have SJC. Now what the heck is an SJC? SJC, excuse me. An SJC is a show and jump championship. Back in the day, uh, before Konami took over things, Upper Deck used to run things over here in the TCG for the most part until they were filed, a lawsuit was filed against them because they found out, Konami found out they were making fake cards and that's a whole legal battle I'm not going to go into but pretty much for a long period of time between I believe it was 2004 uh, to about around 2010 I think it was, I know it was after, around Crossroads of Chaos time frame early on in the 5Ds era, pretty much Upper Deck ran things and Pretty much, you, they also had amazing prize cards back then. You had Crush Card, uh, Cyberstein was one of them, Shrink was another good prize card back in those days. They also had, I know, I believe they had also the Dark Lord cards, the original ones from the GX that we use, uh, like Superbia and the other ones. So they had a lot of cool prize cards back then too, but a SJC is literally the equivalent to a YCS nowadays. The only difference is Konami runs things instead of Upper Deck, so they changed the name. So that's something that if you've only been playing for a couple of years, you may not even know what the heck an SJC is because unless somebody's talking about, oh, I topped an SJC back in the day, you know, then you probably not even going to hear the word being thrown around anymore, really. Got my phone in front of me for the next one. The next one we have is how expensive the game is. Back in the day, the game was a lot more expensive than it is nowadays. I always hear players talk about you know, that have only been playing the game for a couple of years, especially like in these formats we've had for the last like one to two formats or three formats where the game has gotten expensive because there's more staple cards in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh. Back in the day, there was a lot of expensive cards and things didn't get reprinted as quickly. So they stayed expensive for the most part. Uh, nowadays, we have Mega Tens, reprint sets, Gold Series, Things get reprinted, you know, within a year or two. That wasn't always the case back in the day. Back in the day, you had things like Dad, that was a hundred dollar, you know, tell, you know, Dark Arm Dragon Dad, which was a hundred dollars back in the day. You had things like Itali and Stardust Dragon. I remember Stardust Dragon, like the Ghost Rare. Oh my gosh, like Stardust Dragon was the boss monster back in the early days, and that thing when it first came out of Duelist Genesis was like I think thirty, forty dollars just for that one card. Um, you had, you know, a lot of staple cards that only got their reprints once every, like, two, three years. You would have to wait for them to come out of the main set again. I mean, it took, I think it took, like, Dad about, I think it took Dark Arm Dragon about two, three years to get reprinted. Um, its first reprint, so it took a lot longer for things to get reprinted. It didn't happen within a year. You didn't have to think about, oh, there's a Mega Ten coming out. You didn't have things, you know, where you get like the ratios were different back then. You know, you only got like prior to Duelist Genesis, you only got a rare or a suit, you know, a hollow card in every pack. After Duelist Genesis, you got a hollow and a rare. And nowadays, we have a super in every pack. You get two secrets per box. The ratios are a lot more than they were back then. Especially even when I was going back to when I was a kid, everything was expensive back then. You know, most cards like you wanted were like 20 and above or 15 and above unless they got a reprint. And you usually had to wait for structure decks, special editions, 
or um, something we had back then called retro packs. And retro pack one, two, and three, those were like the sets like, oh my gosh, you got good reprints out of them. But you may have to wait a year or two for the net, for it to come out in the next retro pack. So yes, I understand the, the game is very expensive nowadays, but when I look at it and I've lived through it from what it was in the past, oh my gosh, it was a lot more expensive back then. But I'm not saying today's game of Yu-Gi-Oh is not cheap. It's somewhat expensive. The next thing we have is priority. Now priority, some people don't even know what the priority is. And a lot of times, and the reason I put this at number three is because I usually have to teach this to players that really haven't played the game for that long. Every time you know I talk about priority to them, they're like, what's priority? And I have to explain it to them, especially when I'm trying to teach them GOAT format or Dark Arm Dragon format or Dad Return or whatever the case is, older formats. I'm like, well, you have to keep in mind, we're going to play with priority. And they're like, what's priority? Priority, I'll give you a simple example of what priority is. So say I summon uh, my Black Luster Soldier, okay? So I summon my Black Luster Soldier, but you activate Bottomless Trap Hole. Okay, on the summary of my bus, uh, my bust, uh, Buster Black, <laughs> my BLS. Okay, so on the summary of my BLS, but you act, you activate bottomless. I would call I would call priority, and I would say I chain. I'm gonna activate. I call priority. I'm gonna activate my BLS's effect and banish your monster. So even though that monster is gonna get banished you still lose a monster out of it. It was so broken, like, another thing was with JD. If you destroy that JD, I can still activate JD's effect because I call it priority. It made JD broken, and I think that's one of the reasons priority went away. It was something that a lot of players hated about the game of Yu-Gi-Oh. It was just so stupid, you know, like, even though I, I'm gonna get rid of your monster, you know, it's not like, nowadays if I summon a DLS and you stop it with a, you know, a bottomless trap hole, I don't get BLS's effect. I can't call it priority. But back then, for a long time, part of Yu-Gi-Oh's history, I could still activate BLS's effect even though I'm going to lose it. Or if I summon that JD and you're going to destroy my JD, I can still call it priority, pay the thousand and blow up the field still. Even though my board's going to be wiped because the JD's gone, it just, it was stupid. If you understand what I'm saying, like, and nowadays that doesn't happen. If I summon a JD and you activate a bottomless, I'm not going to get JD's effect. But back then, if you activate a bottomless and I had I normal summon the JD and you activate bottomless, yes, the JD will get benched, but I still get JD's effect off because I call priority. So it was very, very stupid. It was a little bit comp more complex than that. I apologize if I confused you. But newer players do not understand how stupid that ruling was, and I'm so happy they got rid of it. I think it was in 2012, 2011. Um, they got rid of it. Konami said, enough of priority, and I was like, everybody in the community was like, holla freaking Luya. Priority made cards that made cards better, and with priority gone, it made good cards not as good, and it made bad cards better, like bottomless and whatnot. And whatnot. But yeah, I hate priority. I'm so happy that's not around, but a lot of players do not understand what priority was if you play this game only for a short period of time. The next thing I want to talk about is something that's just not thrown around in the community really anymore, and that is board and hand presence. That's number two. The reason that is number two is because nobody talks about it anymore. Board and hand presence. Board and hand presence. Board presence is when you have an established board. So say, compare that to nowadays where I like, I make a powerful board. Now you have to break my board. That's board presence. That's what we call that. Hand presence means while, even, while you're keeping up board presence, you, you made a powerful field, you're not investing too much into that. That way, in case your opponent cracks your board, you still have another play that you can go off with. So it was pretty much like um, your opponent makes the first move, uh, you know, you make the first move, your opponent makes the, the counter move, and if they don't have a backup play, that's when you use your hand advantage, the cards that you've accumulated, to make a second punch and knock your opponent out. So it's like blow for blow, blow. it's like back and forth. You make a play, they make a play, they don't have a, a play, you know, another play, then you use that hand advantage to wipe them out. So that's what it was talking about, hand and field advantage. It was something that was talked about a long time. 
I guess you could say more when the game was more strategical and more slow, but nowadays with OTKs and just how much advantage you know you can gain from that, I mean another word you could tack on to hand and field advantage is plussing, the art of plussing, which no one talks about anymore, which is pretty much you had to work for your pluses more. Nowadays you just activate a card and oh, I get a plus one. Back then, yeah, you did have things like Pot of Greed early on and things like that, but a lot of decks, you had to work to gain that plus one, or you had to use your smarts to out their board, you know. Do I use the Heavy Storm now, or do I wait to use the Heavy Storm, because maybe he has more back row, and I just have to bait him out with it. So, the art of plus scene, hand and field advantage, nobody talks about it anymore, probably because the game has gotten so fast, and plusing is so easy to do nowadays in a lot of archetypes. You don't have to work for them as much. So, especially, but the thing is, you still need to learn those fundamentals of Yu Gi Oh! because when you're in the grind game and you're in crunch, crunch time, if you've done that stuff over and over and over again and you're used to those situations, you, even if you're tired, your brain will just go on autopilot sometimes and you'll be able to think not as much. You'll be like, okay, I just know what I need to do here. Uh, we're low on resources, but this is how I can outgain my opponent. And that is still true in today's game if you're in the grind game, especially when it's the games, you know, you're playing slower decks. It's very true, even though nobody talks about it anymore. And the number one thing that people do not, that only old school players will understand, is how hard it, it was back in the day to gain information about Yu Gi Oh! and just information in general. So when Yu Gi Oh! first came out in 2002, uh, in 2003, 2004, all the way up, I would say, up until the Zexo era, to some degree. Early, you know, the late 5Ds era, there was information out there. But early on, back in the day, you know, you had things like Pojo. Uh, I mean, even if you're going back even further, you had um, Pojo and Dueling Rounds were two good things back in the day, I remember. Ah, good times. Especially Pojo. But before that, you had to go like to magazines. Back before the internet became really popular, you know, in the early 2000s, we didn't, not everybody had internet. I didn't have internet. A lot of my friends didn't have internet. If you had internet, you were considered kind of rich. <laughs> I mean, even though this was the early 2000s, look how much 10 years has changed from back then. But beside the point, you had to turn to magazines to get information on Yu-Gi-Oh! because there wasn't a lot of forums out there. And if there was forums, you had to go to those forums to find that information on Yu-Gi-Oh! So some of the main things that people used was Beckett price guide for price guiding things because that was literally the only thing we had out there. But Beckett, by the time it came out, the magazine, the prices could have fluctuated already. It's not like nowadays where it's like the stock market and daily this is what could happen to cards. Like, woo, up and down, it's soaring, it's falling. You know, it wasn't like that back then. It was like things didn't like change that drastically. Like the set would get released, prices would come out, okay, that's what they're going to be. Uh, the reprints would come out maybe with special editions. Okay, the prices go down a little bit unless it's a staple card. And then, you know, that's it just stayed at that price until like it became a super popular card and it would go up a little bit. It wasn't like when people like nowadays, oh, this is going to be a good tech card in the future. No, that wasn't always the case. To find those tech cards, you actually had to go online to forums or know people at your locals or regionals that you talk to. Talking with people was the main way to get information back then. Picking people's brains, seeing what tech cards they had at your locals or regionals that people were playing, that's how you gain information in the early days. Later on in the 5Ds and, Z and um, GX, later GX era, we did have YouTube to some degree in the 2007, 2008, 2009. Uh, by 2009, I think we had like people like Import40, you know, 2010. So we had people out there that were giving us some information, but that was very few and far between. It's not like nowadays when I look at my Yu-Gi-Oh feed for my channel, it's just like, price guy, price guy, new text, new pro you know, cards, new decks, you know. I remember when people were like trying to figure out, just like nowadays, like you get on Shriek to find out the new OCG cards. Like nobody uses Shriek anymore, we don't need it. But back in the day you had Shriek and you would go down there to see what's the new OCG cards coming out, you know, five months, six months from now. Oh, this is what the OCG's playing, you know. Information is so readily available to us nowadays. 
especially in the Yu-Gi-Oh community because we're in a technology, you know, age of technology and, you know, everybody can, you know, carries a mini computer in their hand, literally like, you know, an iPhone's a mini computer compared to what we had back in the early days. I mean, we had brick phones, you know, we couldn't get on the internet, you know, like one click. Um, so the fact that we have that nowadays, it really affects us just in general. It's a new age and players that played back in the day, they will understand that. But players that haven't been playing that long would not completely understand that because they didn't have to grow up with that. I mean, I remember back in the day there was a Yu-Gi-Oh system. <laughs> and like we have Dev Pro and Yu-Gi-Oh Pro, like we had DN, you know, click a button, download, get on it. Cool. Back in the day, you had to have a server set up. So you had to give out your IP number for your house to your friend <laughs> so you could do online <laughs> and still then like the images were like this small it was like little teeny cards i remember there was like two or three i forget what they were called but like i remember there was different games like that you had to do that like oh my buddy at locals let me give him my ip number hope he doesn't give it out to anybody he doesn't hack my computer like you don't do that nowadays giving out ip numbers to friends and whatnot so you can do online that that's not a thing <laughs> You know, we don't have that anymore. So that was something like people don't understand. Like to duel, it was really hard to do online. It wasn't like I could play Yu-Gi-Oh every single day. It was more like, okay, you have locals and you got regionals and you got school. And those are the three places you pretty much play Yu-Gi-Oh. And maybe if you're lucky to have internet, maybe if you get a server, like you can definitely play online. People don't understand. I feel some degree, I know some older players understand, like DN was a blessing and you don't notice how much you had it, you know, how good it was to some some degree, some degree in quotes, until it's gone and how much the community really wants another DN. But for years, we never had a DN and we completely survived without it. And I think players that grew up with DN don't understand, you know, they find it hard to believe that, we, you know, that there was a time before those online servers that we had, like when you had to give out our P numbers and cards were like in little black texts and like you had to click on that, click on the card, even look at the text. It was just ridiculous back then. It was kind of like the Game Boy Advance games. And like back then I had to use the Game Boy Advance games and Game Boy games and DS's even up in the 5Ds era to actually test decks out. I, had a, I brought the game so I could just do testing on those little simulators. I would like use a cheat code, get all the cards, and just like, okay, let's build decks, let's test them, test them, test them. Any nights I wasn't going to locals, I mean, that was a thing. So, believe me, a lot of players back in the day that didn't, that played nowadays want to understand that. But those are my top five th reasons. I apologize, I ran it, I went on a rant at the end there, but believe me, nobody completely, unless you played it back in the day, you would not understand that. But, those are my top five things that only old school players will understand the struggles, I guess you could say. <laughs> will understand those things. But till next time, take care, have fun dueling, good luck dueling. I hope you guys all enjoyed this video. I had a lot of fun making it, so I'll see you guys next time. And good luck dueling to all of you.